Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Come meet. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Can you, can anyone see me? I'm, I'm Adrian. No, nope, we can't see you. Hi, Adrian. Hi. 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 So good, so good to hear you. Yeah, same with you. Is it the middle of the night for you, Lavender? I've stayed up all night just to be with you. Wow. <laughs> wow, and what time is it at your place, Adrian? Um, 10.30 p.m. Oh, not too bad. It's not too bad, is it? What about over there? Where about to you, Kamit? I'm in Spain. I'm in the south oh, of yeah. Spain and it's uh, 2.30. Yeah. <laughs> I, have to look. I like to have to look at the clock to see. 2.30 in the morning? No, no, in the afternoon. In the afternoon. <laughs> and uh, Lavender Grace, what, how, what time is it over there? It's 5.30 in the morning. Oh, <laughs> so uh, we started at four in the morning. So I thought I'd just stay up all night. <laughs> so, <laughs> fair enough. Yeah. yeah, very good. I think I might turn some light on. Is yeah. it a bit dark? A it bit is dark, a bit right? dark. Okay, hang on a sec. Carmi, did I see Francisco? Um. I'm not sure if he's on today. I think he was on the other, just at the very end on the other call, just for a second, he blipped in, I thought, but maybe not. Ah, here he is, I see him, yes. Oh, good. Right. Okay, so, yeah, so, oh, hang on. Oh, yeah, so you are. So full screen here. So, mm -hmm. uh, ladies and gentlemen, I see that some of you managed to move from one meeting to the next one. Uh, thank you, Zoom. <laughs> I think it's a nice uh, symbol that Zoom is uh, it's also connected to the B world, right? Um, <laughs> so let's see. We're going to start soon with our international beekeepers experts from all. And I see some of our experts are already with us. Um, so my name is Matan Israeli. If you haven't joined us before, we are from Muslala and we've been at this event uh, together with Magen David Adom and together with the um, uh, ambassador of, of Slovenia. Uh, that Slovenia was the one that initiated the World Bee Day. Um, so we're very happy and honored to be hosting this international event. We are going to start because we have so many guests that are going to speak today. And our first, and our first, and our sp our first speaker is Albert Mueller from Nijbroek. I'm sorry if I'm not sure how to say this, from the Netherlands. Uh, Albert is a biologist and has been working for the Univers University of Utrecht uh, since 1972. Uh, in 1975, he has uh, had bees, and since 1979, he's a beekeeper, beekeeping teacher and a member of the Dutch working group uh, for, on the biologic, biological and dynamic, dynamic beekeep, beekeepers. Uh, the, the agriculture school that he has been working on has been doing exchange with Uganda. There were students together with of course, with Uganda pupils, uh, set up different and various projects. Um, he has four more initiatives worldwide. He has been teaching all over, including here in Israel. And, and we're very pleased to have you with us today. And please, Albert, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Great. How are you today? Very good, very well. We're very happy that you are with us. The stage is yours. Uh, thank you. Okay, I want to start to thank you for the in invitation. I'm honored to bother you with my thoughts. <laughs> uh, what are bees telling me is, my, is the highlight and what I'm telling to my bees. 
In my bee garden, uh, I find uh, mostly eight till 15 colonies. And uh, I look for them on a special way. What is my way of looking? What's my way of working? What is experiences with bees? I, when I look to bees, what I, do I see? Uh, how is my thinking about this creature? The most of us see bees, yeah, a colony with one queen, thousands of worker bees and hundreds of drones. And I see one animal. An animal consisting of thousands of worker bees, one queen, hundreds of drones, all separate from each other and yet unit in that life with me. She's staying with me, or come to me, or leave me. And I try to make a contact with my bees talk, think, images. What I can't do is splitting. You can split, you can split a colony, but you cannot split an animal. <laughs> Only the animal can decide it. And when I watch how during the year the behavior changes, I see an image that reminds me of yeast or a moba. They divide and there are two. And swarms give me the same experience. Let's see. In the Netherlands, we say the queen leaves the hive and the workers and the drones are following her. No. No, the workers decide, a part leaves the hive and the queen is following. In 1968, I was a student and together with two other students, I had to investigate whether the workers were following the queen or what the interaction was like. It was a nice investigation. For swarms mostly come when the weather is good. So when it's raining, now the raining days, as a student, you can stay in the pub. You only work with beautiful weather. And how it was? We waited, and when the swarm comes out, we took the queen from the flight board in a queen cage, and then on a long stick, and so we brought the queen into the swarm. To see, yeah, walking, the swarm is in the air, and we are walking with the queen in that queen cage, following, bring the queen in the swarm, and then bring her out. Are the bees going with the queen? No, the bees aren't going with the queen. And the outcome was that the bees in the swarm don't follow the queen. But when the swarm starts to build a cluster, after a while the queens come through, she arrives, and that's the born of a new animal. That moment that the queen is coming. If the queen doesn't follow, she doesn't arrive, we see that after a while, the cluster becomes restless, flies up, and flies back to the hive. I had such an experience. Yeah, I was by my hives. The swarm comes out. 
after a while she is hanging in a tree, but before I saw the queen. The queen was walking on the flight by the flight entrance, walked to the left, walked to the right, walked again to the left, again to the right, and walked inside. The swan hangs on the tree. And after 10, 15 minutes, they all start flying and flow back into the hive. Three hours later, rain began. So she had the weather forecast better heard as her daughters uh, when they go. What is a swan? The forest swan, I call her the mother swan. Uh, I know, I always say that's a mother swan. Why? It's the mother with her daughters and drones. So the after swan, when she is coming out, I call her daughter swan. Queens and workers are daughters. They are all sisters. And that is a totally different swarm in her, the behavior as a mother swarm. You must treat her totally different. What's happening with a mother swarm? The queen has lived one year, sometimes more years, on this place. She was living here and collecting from the environment the wisdom. Not every year, there are much beekeepers think that a, a colony is uh, moving every year. Yeah, you must not let them swarm, they disappear and so on. No, she has lived here, she has collected her wisdom and she flies out to go somewhere else to bring it with her. And what's happening? The beekeeper comes and says, no, no, you're mine catches her and takes her back into the apiary. This goes against the biology of the bee. There was, uh, and how I work now, there are always empty hives on my apiary. The swamps goes out and goes away. Or go into an empty hive or stay hanging on a tree. And when they, after a while, haven't started to go away, I kept them. Yeah? Put them in a scab and bring them to another beekeeper. Tom Seeley is describing in his book, Bee Democracy, how the scout bees look for places, for a new place. And what attention they pay. Yeah? The location, how high the location is, the content, they walk inside and more times to look from, is this the right place? What strikes me, and it has struck me since 1975 when I started with bees, in the beginning as a conventional beekeeper, and then I already strikes me. And of course, you have the same feeling. They don't do 
those scout bees don't pay attention how big the nectar flow is. And if we were, are aware of this feeling, an extremely important message is generated for us, for us beekeepers. Why not? Why not they pay attention to the nectar flow? It's not in the genes. And the only explanation I have for this is that the bees have always lived in an environment overflowing with nectar. They haven't learned to look for that. That was never a problem. So, as a beekeeper, we know that bees can do everything. Themselves, they can build their own combs, they can build their cells, they can collect their honey, they can collect their pollen, they treat, yeah, they can build their own queen cells. Yeah? Lots of people think you must have plastic cups. No, they do it by themselves. The only thing or they can't do is planting plants. And you are responsible for that. You are responsible to plant a plant. Plant, plant, plant. A friend of me, my soulmate in bees, said years ago, if I know I'm going to die tomorrow, I'll plant an other tree today. Enjoy your bee and plant, plant a tree. This sentence came by me this morning at five o'clock when I was preparing this speech. Well, I was very early wake up and it was nice to be so early working on this meeting. Another thing, maybe. I'm crazy. Of course I'm crazy. That's what lots of people think. Why? I will tell you. When I remove a comb from a hive, I act like a wax moth. A wax, when a wax moth comes on a comb, she eats it and it is destroyed. When I take a comb from a hive, I don't eat it. Yeah, but I destroy it. It will never come in another colony. Why not? We are, every colony built his own wax. And like us, yeah, we are all, all human beings. We are all bones and human flesh. But there is a real difference between us. Yeah? Lots of differences in shape, but also in quality, in what's, what is that meat that people have on their bones. <laughs> and so has every colony his own wax, with his own composition. Friend of me has also a beehive, has also an apiary in the north of France and when he's making candles and he is lighting the candle I smell ah this is a candle from wax from France ah this is a candle from it's a Dutch wax the smell is totally different and it's totally different for every colony 
I can tell you it's different. There is a difference in the walks between drone walks from drone cells and walks from worker cells. A few years ago, I have melted the wax separately and you have totally different candles, a do totally different flame, totally different temperature. You have a flame who is very calm, very calm, is the one candle. The other flame is very excited, that flame. What's the difference? The excited flames is from work, worker walks, work for worker bees. The quiet flame is from drone walks. Why I don't bring can, combs over, it's like a transplantation from the one colony to the other. It was, I found it very nice. It was me a pleasure to bring my thoughts to you and I stay to hear other people. Thank you. Um, thank you, Albert. And I think this is a good opportunity um, also to invite uh, one, one question maybe from somebody from our visitors and audience or maybe from other experts that would like to react uh, or give his thoughts. We're soon going to move to Adrian, uh, but we have, few, we have time for just one sec, one question. And if you have a, a question, just pop up the, to the, on stage, okay? And if not, All right, so maybe we'll do a session of questions later on for yes, all our maybe. experts. Yes, okay. Um, so before maybe not just one thing. Yes. Then they maybe the other question. I'm now living site 20,004 with my bees, without fighting for Oa. Now, the bees live together with for Oa. And do, don't die on Faroa. It's very, very well. And I live in, I work on the University of Wageningen together with four initiatives who are working with that. Okay, I stop. You, you, you gave us all such a, an announcement, so you need to give us also a bit more. Because we all are, in a sense, uh, you know, ch challenged by Varroa by different ways. Yeah, Each yeah. one in his own spot. But maybe give us a few more thoughts about Varroa also. He yeah, gave us so many ideas about bees. Let's think about the, maybe the perspective of Varroa. What does, where did they come from? What do they try to teach us? Or do they... Yeah, uh, yeah what teach... It's interesting when you look at the books, uh, when I look at the, bo the, the, the bee books here in the Netherlands, you, I see that in every 20 years so, since 1900, a new bee disease comes by the bees. In 1900, it was Nozema. It was the only bee disease what was spoken in the books, in that old B book. 1920, the white disease, the Acarapis woody disease. 1940, by us came foul boots. 1960, Faroa came. Not by us, but Faroa has started our disease Faroa. Uh, not Froa Jacobsoni, uh, but Froa, yeah. The disease uh, Froa started in the 60s. Uh, then it started. And so you see 
uh, what Snach also is coming is that so are we talking about diseases or are we talking about warnings yeah are we as beekeepers get a, 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 a warning to change our behavior and we don't we are bad learning from that yeah every time again a disease must warn us and so i started now yeah 16 years ago i started as uh, saying okay uh, it is no longer a disease the bees must live with the varroa together mm -hmm. and it's very interesting yeah we have now an investigation from three years behind us and we have started with a new investigation from three years but in the first investigation are the biodynamic beekeepers are the the bees are, there were uh, 10 beehive bee colonies from us in the investigation we had the most the most natural uh, falling down from dead mites in our hives we had in our hives the most infected worker bees with deformed wing virus in compared to 100 other beehives. We had no symptoms, no uh, yeah, death from colonies, no deformed wing viruses symptoms. We have just very, we have colonies with who are, can be, uh, how must I say it, say it, can live like a bee. That's the only thing we do. Okay, you live like a bee. You can swarm when you want. When you don't want to swarm, you don't swarm. There is in the winter time by us yeah is from uh, 1st of september till in march that is no winter but it's the rest period there is no longer uh, a honey flu there is uh, and formerly it was real winter time nowadays it's warm and uh, it's a new problem but we don't touch our hives in that time yeah, I don't look, I only look in my hives to see how is the colony is growing, do, do they need space or not. And when they have space, uh, they need space, I give a frame and they build their own cups. And that those cups are of course, they start with new fresh combs, but the combs are not changed within three years. The combs are changing when the bees are changing. So there are lots of things to think about how I manage with bees and how can I survive bees. And what is happening uh, are my colonies are uh, they infected with varroa bring they the infection to other colonies that's my investigation this summer uh, i'm uh, examining this summer looking for how for the drones are always the bad guys yeah uh, they bring varroa to everyone i don't believe that and i start to examine drones and counting mites on the drones when they leave the hives and when they come back in the hives yeah i will count maybe thousand two thousand drones and count how many varroa mites are on those drones and i think they, they are very less and not, I will tell you, yeah, when there are 
very less, I tell you also, but that's in autumn it's finished when there are no longer drones. Okay, so we're looking forward to hear more about your research. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. And so you'll have to, uh, on our next uh, bid day celebration, we will, next year, hopefully, we'll hear from you, maybe before. Maybe, if, I hope that we meet each other before. I hope so. Yeah, yeah. I hope yeah. to, it was, I've enjoyed to be in Israel very, it was a very beautiful course. And also in January, I have, it was exciting to be by you and uh, I hope it will be last not so long. We also hope so. Thank you so much, Albert, for joining us. Yes. And we're soon going to fly very far away from the Netherlands. We're going to fly all the way to Australia. Um, but before we do this, we want to share with you something that I think is, is for me, it's uh, touching me directly in the heart. Um, together with the Slovenia Embassy, we, we invited kids from all over the world to send us their thoughts about these, their paintings. And if you look at the screen, you'll see some of the paintings and we will, between each one of our experts, will give us, will give space also to the beautiful works that were sent to us. We invited all the kids that uh, send us uh, the works to visit us in one of our beekeeping centers. Uh, in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv, or in the hills of Jerusalem. Um, and we know that the future of, the future is depending, the future of the world is depending on all of us, but definitely we need to raise a new generation of kids that are connected to nature, connected to bees. And we're so happy that uh, we got this opportunity. Um, and now I want to uh, introduce uh, um, Adrian. Adrian Lodis is from Melbourne, Australia, and is uh, from an organization called Beacon Naturally. Uh, and he's been teaching it all over Australia. He's currently working on a bee rehabilitation project after the devastating bushfires that burn millions of hectares of native forest along the East Coast. Adrian, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, we hear you great. Hello, Yossi. <laughs> um, so, uh, thank you for joining us. And what time is it now in Australia? Um, Before you, after you, what, what day is it? Well, it's 11 p.m., Wednesday the 20th. Okay. So we're, I think we're seven hours ahead of Israel. So we're still in the 20th. It's good. We're yes, still just one hour, one hour left. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So tell us a bit. You've had a, quite a rough period in back there somewhere. All over Australia, we've been, all our hearts were with you while you were fighting fire. Yes, well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me here today. It's uh, very, I feel very blessed. Thank you. Um, and um, can I start? I just received a text message while I was sitting here. Uh, and it's a beautiful poem from a man called Robin Burbage. Um, and some of you might know him. Robin came to uh, Holland with me. Um, he couldn't be here this evening. So I'll start the poem. It's, it's quite short. We gather today in heart, spirit, mind, coming together, even online, to love the bees that sing loud and true, revealing to us what we could do. If we flew together in grandfather's son, for the joy of absolutely everyone, revealing to see generosity in unity. The elation of creation is the sweetest of song and we can sing it together our entire life long. 
Thank you, BN, for showing me the truth of this earthly community. <laughs> and that's from Robin Burbage. So thank you, Robin. <laughs> um, so Robin and I are working on a, a very important project. Um, and we've, um, we've been lucky enough to, to have the help from the Natural Beekeeping Trust in England and from um, Michael Verspau from Boom Tree Bees. I, uh, I received an email from Heidi Herman uh, from the Natural Beekeeping Trust uh, just after, after the fires um, came through our property. And um, she asked me how, how, how they could help, how she could help. And coincidentally, I spent that day looking uh, through the forest and, and looking at um, lots of colonies that I knew previously existed in, in certain trees, wild colonies. We have lots of wild bees here in Australia still. Uh, we don't have Varroa, so we, we're one of the lucky ones. Um, and I've been watching a few wild bee colonies on our property. We live on, on, a, on, a, on a large property. And um, I spent uh, a little bit of time with one particular colony that um, was at head height. So I could, I could actually see it, it, it lived in a, in a hollow tree, but the, the entrance wasn't small. It, it, was, it was the size of a football. And they tucked in underneath on the roof. And, and if I stuck my head in there or if I stuck my, my mobile phone in there with the <laughs> camera, I could, I could see them. Um, but those bees had, had died, they'd burnt. And there was melting wax that had poured out of the front of, of that colony and poured down the front of the tree. And uh, I was taken to tears. I, 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 was, I was really upset and, and I was crying. And, um, and then I received that email from Heidi. And, what came to me was, was these bees, whatever bees are still alive in the forests, whatever bees are still alive in those forests, won't be for long because there's absolutely no food left for them. The forests were devastated. There's, there's, there's no, there was no grass, no flowers, no trees for millions and millions of hectares, for miles and miles and miles, kilometers of, of, of just black sticks sticking up out of the ground. So I knew that um, a lot of those bees will, that did survive, that moved on or tucked in deep into a tree cavity would probably starve to death sooner or later. So I, I emailed Heidi back and I said, send over Michael from Boom Tree Bees to help us build rehabilitation log hives and we started that project. Michael did come over um, and we started the project and we, before Michael arrived, we, we had a ceremony for a healing ceremony for, for the land, for the people that were involved in the fires in the local community, in my community, for the bees, for the plants, for the animals, all the animals that suffered. And um, we asked the local Aboriginal Indigenous people, an organisation, they have an organisation called Back to Country, to come and do the ceremony with us. So we, we had 400 plants donated to us, uh, saplings, small plants, um, all bee plants, so not just European honeybees, but native bee plants as well. So uh, we invited the community to come to the ceremony and 150 people turned up. Um, and, uh, and their children, grandparents, 
so many people were there. It was amazing. It was an amazing experience. And we did a healing ceremony by smoking, smoking the area and smoking the people. Uh, Uncle Max Dulamumun Harrison led the ceremony, said some words, spoke to the people, and then everybody got a chance to plant a tree or, or one, of the, one of the shrubs that, uh, that were donated to us. Um, that ceremony and that, that rehabilitation project, we want to spread right across through the, all the fire affected communities. So people can connect to reconnect and plant plants back into the, to the earth. We have had lots of rain since then and plants have started to come back. It's, it's incredible how quick mother nature repairs. Um, but we still know that lots more planting needs to be, needs to be done. Um, and those healing ceremonies need to happen for the people as well as for the animals and the plants and, and the earth right across the east coast of Australia. Um, so we started that project and um, then uh, Michael came and we ran a couple of workshops on how to build log hives, um, which was fantastic. And uh, he sent some tools over and he, he spent two weeks here. He had to cut his trip short because of uh, Corona. So uh, airports were getting shut down. So he had to leave early and um, unfortunately he couldn't stay for the three week term that he was originally supposed to be here for. So talking about or hearing Albert Muller talk about planting trees and plants it seems to be the subject and topic at the moment, for me especially. Um, whether you've been hit by fire or not, bees won't survive without trees and trees won't survive without bees. Simple as that. Um, so we really need to continue planting more and more plants and trees not just for the bees, but for all pollinators, including bats. We have um, sugar gliders here, little possums, very small little possums, and they feed on nectar and, and pollen, um, and all sorts of uh, creatures that, that thrive on, on trees and, and plants. So my message to the world is to Go out and, and plant some plants in your backyard. Fill your, black, fill your backyard if you have one. Make a huge garden there. If you live in an apartment and you have a balcony, plant. I can't hear you. Um, are you speaking? No, sorry. <laughs> if you have a, a balcony outside your apartment, plant, uh, plant, plant flowers in, in there, you know. Uh, just get out there and do it. Put your hands in the soil. Reconnect with Mother Earth. Um, people that um, came to that, that initial ceremony hadn't been able to go back to their homes um, and do any work there because going back to their burnt home or their burnt land meant uh, too much pain for them. But planting a plant on the property that we did the ceremony on, which was coincidentally my property that I share with four other families, three other families, sorry. Um, people that people were able to plant, make that first step and reconnect with mother earth. And people were able to go back to their properties and start to plant again. The first things they did was planting a garden rather than cleaning the mess or or will begin building their home. They planted gardens of vegetables and, 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 um, and flowers for the bees and for themselves. And that was their way of healing and reconnecting to their land, to the land they, 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 they lived on and loved so much. So very, very uh, big message there for me and, and how important it is to 
by just planting into the soil, we, we are able to heal ourselves. And by healing ourselves, we're also healing the land and, and healing everything around us because we, we're feeding and uh, we're nurturing ourselves, we're nurturing Mother Earth, we're nurturing the animals that thrive on, on everything around us. So that's my message there tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Well, and um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions about um, the project that we're, uh, of course it's been put on hold <laughs> since Corona. Um, uh, so we, we really haven't been doing too much. And to be honest, I've, I've really enjoyed not doing anything because after the fires, I, I, I got busy doing the project and, and didn't realise that I just needed to stop for a while and, um, and, and, hang, and, and, and be with my family and children and my wife and, um, and, and completely stop. So that's what we've been doing. It's, it's been a, a blessing, actually. Adrian, thank you. That was uh, touching, and I think all of us felt the fire and the pain that you went through. And we are, you know, we are together in this world, this mm -hmm. tiny blue planet that we share. And Australia is here, and Australia, we are all together there. And we, yeah, we are. Where and this crisis is now maybe more uh, evident all over, but uh, we know that if one sure thing is sure, is that we can go back to normal, because as we said, normal was the problem. Mm. <laughs> the moment of waking up and listening to the messages that we get and thinking of the fire as a message and thinking of the different viruses is if it's a the varroa or if it's the covid let's start to open our hearts and our ears to these messages mm. so right now i want us to do another flight uh, to i just um, say one more thing sorry yeah of course i'd like to take this opportunity and, and really thank Heidi Herman and the Natural Beekeeping Trust. And I'd really like to thank Michael Vespal from Boomtree Bees. I really, really thank you very, very much. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. Cheers. Yeah, thank you. And the beautiful poem you, you read to us, you can maybe add it to the chat if you, if you are willing to share it. Okay. And of course, you can also add more information about your project there, and everybody is well is, can look at at more de deeply. Um, yeah, so uh, we have here another beautiful paintings by our kids, and if you look at the chat, you will see that there is a link there that you can see all the 130 paintings that were sent to us worldwide. And we are moving now straight all the way to Los Angeles. Uh, <laughs> Michael Joshin Tiele, and I am also sure that I'm mistaking the name, but I hope maybe not. <laughs> um, Michael's pioneering approach. Michael, you're with us, right? Yes, I am. Good morning. So nice yeah. to be here. Oh, you have the morning still. Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm sitting on my front porch and I see the sunrise as we speak right now on the west coast of the US. Um, so before uh, I let you <coughs> continue, I want to just introduce you, Sean. Um, so my, Michael's pioneering approach to apiculture as a platform for global renewal has appeared in national and international magazines, books, and films. He has presented his work at Harvard University, New York University, and consulted for the USDA. And in 2006, developed the organization Gaia Biz to advance biodynamic practices in apiculture. Michael has been Michael, involved. Yeah. Michael, yeah. Michael, yeah. Uh, Michael has been involved in the creation of several honeybee sanctuaries, and in 2017, he created in us our 
platform for a multidisciplinary approaches towards rewilding conservation and protection of honeybees in the Anthropocene. Michael received lay ordination within the Zen Buddhist tradition and pursue apiculture within a social, cultural, and spiritual dimension. He is an edge walker within the dynamic and holistic apiculture field and researches the relevance of the Appian consciousness for us uh, as human beings with this family and infinity in the oak, oak woodland of California now is watching the sunrise. Michael, <laughs> it's so great to have you with us. It is wonderful to be here and it's wonderful to join you all worldwide as, as belonging, such deep belonging to the winged ones who took us all under their wings, really, whether that was by choice or not, but um, here we are um, being so fortunate to live in the presence of such a being and be so fortunate to have this phenomenon, this gift really uh, be part of our life. Could we truly imagine life without? I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> I, <clears throat> excuse me, I, um, I was wondering whether I at the beginning could share a short video, it's a two minute video, um, to do, to, to have us um, enjoy the visual and the sound of that what and cannot live without, and also um, narrated with words by Adrian, and you may know her by Deborah Bird Rose, who did wonderful work in Australia. And I love her writing, and I think it's so appropriate uh, to combine it with bees. <clears throat> so I would just switch it over as an opener, yeah, if I may. Please, yes. So please. go here. And some of you may have seen the video already. Um, it was used for the announcement of another ceremony today. So here we go. We breathe in and we breathe out. In this world of connectivity, we live to celebrate another day and to experience life's shimmer as it comes forth in our lives with all manner of tears, happiness, grief, commitment, love, exuberance, and also celebration. The waves of ancestral power that shimmer and grab are also exactly the relationships that bring us forth and sustain us. The kiss of life is an ancestral blessing, a life brilliant and pulsating in the world around us and within us. In this time of extinctions, we are going to be asked again and again to take a stand for life. And we are called into recognition of the shimmer of life's pulses and the great patterns within which the power of life expresses itself. We are therefore called into gratitude. So, <clears throat> it ends by saying we are therefore called into gratitude and um, grat gratitude as such a radical um, 
response to our lives, to this gift given to us to walk on the face of the earth. And <clears throat> I would like to talk a little bit about um, um, I just want to add to what everybody else was already saying uh, in sharing different vantages on, on this phenomenon, this apian phenomenon. One which I often think of is um, so beyond language. <clears throat> um, honeybees seem to have chosen such a unique path within the web of life. And um, there are many who say um, that honeybees really belong to a different kind of level of consciousness. Um, they are incarnated in such a way which, is, which seems often mm, not, almost not palpable for our limited ways of being. Um, but, however, it seems that um, there are honeybees are able to show a different way through the embodiment of, of things we may not necessarily uh, place together. And in, because of our ways of viewing things, it often mm, appears almost as an, as an enigma, this combining um, seemingly polar opposites from um, uh, being a cold, being a, a bunch of cold-blooded insects, but in truth constituting the warm, uh, constituting a mammalian being, creating together as cold-blooded beings a warm-blooded oneness of being. It is um, leaping way beyond one's own capacities through this alchemical process and in this, what I like to call, through this tissue-like gathering of beings, we are reaching a completely new, literally, vantage of being, vantage of seeing. Um, and, and the other example of the polarities are, of course, the multitude versus the oneness, the, 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 the single being. And here we have this merging of, of categories which is unimaginable, unimaginable for us. We have the, in, the a little insect as, an, as a so-called individual, but it, it abandons its, its identity as an individual and merges into a much larger web, a much larger context. And through dissolving oneself, one, one enables the becoming of something much larger. And how beautiful is that? And how, how can we possibly be with such a being? Um, with a being where um, one of the challenges is the face. We all, in our lives with other mammalian beings, whether it's a cow or a cat or a dog, there's still a face. Mm, with bees, um, it seems 
as if we have to practice in viewing the face, seeing the face. And it may not necessarily happening with our eyes, but with different senses. And it seems as if there is a face it seems as if we even though we may not be able to see the face with our eyes and yet we can sense the presence of the face and and that brings us into this very interesting situation where um, where we step into a relationship which is outside of our regular experiences mm. in some cultures honeybees are being considered to be the holder of space and time the holder of space and time and in some ways, um, it seems as if we were asked, as if we were challenged um, to step into the very moment, into just now, into presence. As if this phase would ask us to step into presence again and again. And th in doing so, we are stepping outside of space and time. And It is in doing so, um, it is also as if by being with bees, we are stepping in front of a mirror, an apian mirror, uh, which is quite different from the mirrors we are familiar with. One could say our reflection in a regular mirror is so... is so deeply determined by our own projections and by, by the ways we see ourselves, And also, and this is, a, I think, an important one, um, our sense of self. Our sense of self truly determines who we think we are. It determines whether or not I believe in others, in the existence of others. And it also... Uh, is the underlying premise on which uh, which defines all other aspects of our life uh, the sense of life and death um, um, the idea that one would be able to own a piece of land one idea that uh, nature is something outside of oneself that all comes back to my sense of self. But when we step in front of the Apian mirror, it seems as if we have no place to hold on to there. It is stepping outside of space and time. It is stepping outside of our regular sense of self in the presence of such a different sense of self, of the apian, this, this sense of self, of, of honeybees, um, which does not differentiate between inside and outside the way we do. The perception of outside is experienced as an extent, an, an extent, extinct, extinct, uh, extension <laughs> of of the inside, 
Um, and how can we be? How does our relationship look like in such a moment when we are in the presence of such an awareness? And I think this may explain um, to some extent why we feel so intimate with honeybees because they're holding for us humans this this deep opportunity of relief we can let go of of this holding on to who i am i don't have to be anyone i don't have to be in a particular way but i can now in the presence feel uh, what Deborah Baudreau calls the shimmer, the shimmer of life. This gift given, the gift I, I, we all are part of this, the mystery of being alive. And by stepping in front of this apian mirror, we can step through a gateway into a different kind of consciousness, into a, a different awareness. It is an opportunity to dissolve what we are holding on to and to kind of liberate this sense of, of liberation. And it comes in different we all experience it in different ways, but I probably, we probably would say that um, we sometimes can feel it in a way of, of losing thought. We probably all know this feeling of having been with bees in, on, a, on a particular day for some time, and that language is kind of dissolving, that we may not be able to speak um, after we have been with bees for a while, because we are being touched by this being, we are being, our hearts are being touched. And the longer we are within this field, the longer we are with these bees, the more our heart responds almost with us, without us noticing it's so subtle and it comes with such deep peace. Um, and joy. Yeah, so we have, we have, I was about to say, we have left normality a long time ago, and I don't know really whether normality existed ever, ever existed, but, um, we do, we are worldwide in such a challenging situation with world, uh, with Mother Earth mm, shifting her ways due to us um, and we see it in climate. Mm. the tremendous loss of life through extinction um, with every life form we lose we lose a part of our selves um, every little microbe every bat every bird we lose mm. It is impoverished, it's, we are impoverished uh, and something is missing. Um, and, and we're in such deep need for inspiration and support and, and compass points and Honeybees are such a compass point. And it begins with 
stepping in front of that apian mirror, all of us, to ask ourselves, who am I? Who am I? And to be really grateful for this opportunity to, uh, to be able to ask that question, who am I in the presence of someone who is so far beyond that question? It is like a child, as a child going to a wise woman and asking, what is life? And share, can you share your wisdom with me as I'm walking through this life? Mm. And this beautiful event, this beautiful uh, idea of bringing us all together today is such a gift. Uh, and I would like to thank everybody for um, listening to ideas who come from somewhere. And if we are quiet enough, we hear them. And then we can see how in a very creative way, like you all did, uh, bring this into form and into, the, into our lives. And so here we are all together and we are all so intimately connected anyway. And Zoom is just reflecting that. It's not creating connection, but revealing connection. And we as apiarians, as apiculturists, as human hearts and the living in the presence of that which is outside and beyond of language. Um, we have this tremendous opportunity to bring the wisdom of bees into our lives, wherever that may be, and in whatever context that may be. So, um, Muslala, maybe that was my sign for my time. Um, I want to thank you, first of all. I, um, it was very much touching. For me, it reflected something else. It was when we planned this day, you know, we're sitting now in Jerusalem. Yeah. Uh, in Jerusalem today, beside the bid day, probably not many of us even are aware of it. Everybody's celebrating the Jerusalem day. It is the day that we, we conquered, conquered is Jerusalem, connected it, uh, occupation, and all these words that are about land, about ownership. Yeah. And, in the, and there is an, an, an attempt in Jerusalem to do an alternative day to this event. Mm -hmm. it is, it's called the day. Uh, for one moment, and afterwards we said we, we were not going to get to do it, but we had an idea to connect the day of the other and the day of the bee. Oh, because that's so that beautiful. The that's bee so is, beautiful. You know, in a city like Jerusalem, that everybody is this is in fear of the other. It might yes. be the ultra orthodox or the Palestinian or the secular, the ultra, whatever you are, you are always minority here. The bees are a great teacher yes. to work with this otherness. Yes, yes, so true, so true. What an opportunity for all of us to let that stream into our lives. And we, and we can be so creative with this. It can take on so many different ways of doing it. Yeah, Good start as the children. I loved the, the pictures you shared. So beautiful. So this was very inspiring. <clears throat> and I need inspiration in these days. Yes. And it's true that the, the world's never normal. And let's not go back to normal, but <laughs> find hope in the small steps each one of us is doing in his world and in his doing. Um, so thank, thank you, you very much. Thank uh, you very much. Michael, for sharing. 
Um, our next speaker, and, and actually we have three next speakers, uh, Karmit Evansu, Paul Ferhesia, and Jorge Galerdo from Spain, from the organization B-Time. And B-Time is an artist-led uh, collective based in Thousand Spain that works with a local community of natural beekeepers and creates art and a to inspire conservation, uh, conversations about relationships in nature. Hello, Spain. Who, who is with us from B-Time? Hello. How are you? Very good. It's been a while since we met last time. Uh, <laughs> last time that you visited it, I think it was last November. spring. November it was. Great. November it was. Yeah. So... What's up, Spain? How are you doing? Actually, uh, our team is kind of um, international right now. <laughs> I, but anyways, I'm speaking from Bulgaria, but I am in Spain and I am also in Australia and Germany <laughs> and San Francisco. And I just want to say thank you for, I don't know, for these threshold or gate through connection to with all of you. I'm feeling touched by just seeing so many people I met uh, in the last years and um, it's, it's touching this opportunity, this uh, gate, <laughs> international, interconnected. So yeah, I'm here in Bulgaria and it's rainy, it's a gray day. <laughs> But I'm going to speak, uh, I, I just want to, yeah, very touched and inspired also by everything I've heard till now. And I just wanted to present you a bit to, and talk to you a bit more about how our journey started. How my journey started with bees. <laughs> and it started with, uh, well, saying, sorry. Saying my, I can't say my journey, I have to say our journey. My colleague Jorge was having the idea to have a picture of each one of ourselves. Meanwhile, one is talking, so we have the other two here. We couldn't uh, make it possible, <laughs> but I will speak from the we and not from the I. Um, yeah, we... Our journey started like six years ago with the creation of a small learning community, which inspired us and immediately connected us to our neighbors and community in a completely different way. We, by learning about bee biology and bees life, we started to have a different um, impression and feeling about our own community. And together with uh, all kinds of workshops about natural apiculture or building workshops or recollecting swarms, campaigns and actions, uh, we also initiated a, an artistic residency in which we started to invite artists from everywhere around the world. So we brought a new point of view to our local community. We kind of try to uh, enrich all points of view in there. And since then it has been a life-changing experience for all of us. As Michael was saying, it's there are so many questions that, that have arisen about how do we want to live together, about our vulnera vulnerability, about are we in nature, about how we can be, how, how we can be connected 
to our community and what what surrounds us the same way as bees are? What about if we try to experience this infinite intimacy we call? And what about if we allow ourselves to experience the time of the bee, the quality, what is the quality of this time? What is the essence of this time? what changes inside us while being in this time. That's why we called our artistic residencies B time, making this game with word game with the word in English, which is B from the honeybee and B from I, to be or not to be. So, we work a lot with the metaphor of everything that we learn from the bees and their way of being. And we try to juxtapose it in our own lives and in our community. And these two main projects led us to a different one, which may colleague Jorge we will talk to you about. Thank you. I'm so Thank nervous. You. As you can see, we organize our time and we put order in our uh, speaks. So hello all again from B time. And as Paul was saying, all this learning leads us to another space of work, and that is the space of memory and the space of the sense of place. So we start to work with the spirit of, the, of this land, of the land that we are inhabiting now, and we start to make a project, a cinema project with kids about the memory of the land and how the people were living here 40 years ago really more uh, connected with uh, nature than now. Here is where my father grew up and I know from him the, his memory of being related with bees. My grandfather was a beekeeper, the last in the village, and I, I, I have the new about that after we start to work with bees. So my relation with bees is through memory and that's why I put my energy to work with the memory of the place here in Santa Lucia, in the village that we are, and uh, put this inside of our work with B time. So we start, Carmi, Paul and I, a project about uh, the memory of this land with kids, and we made three films, but only the last one was really inside of the subject. And then after that, we've got and beautiful invitation from Josie Ode. Hi, Josie. I want to give you a hug. <laughs> um, he was inviting us to go to Israel to uh, be part of the conference that he was uh, leading there. So in our team of three, we are really, really um, good in having three tasks in the time that you can do only one. So we decide to make a journey and a plan of two weeks to have some uh, interviews with people who are working with bees and loving bees all around Israel and Palestine territories. And we start to um, have the idea of make a movie with all this. And now, for this opportunity, we are preparing a bit of what we were recording there in Israel, and I hope you can join us. Thank you. I will share this my screen so uh, we can show you just a glimpse of our experience in Israel last November.
Can you see? Excuse me. No. Nothing. Not yet. You see a okay. black screen. Okay, okay. Can you see? Yes, yeah. we can see now. חושבים, אוקיי, הדברים, בסדר, מביאים דבש וזהו. לא חשבנו על החיים האמיתיים שלהם, איך הם חיים, אבל הצורה והדברים שאמר לנו היה ממש מהמם. הוא הכניס את האהבה יותר ויותר ללב, ללבבות שלנו, לכל הקבוצה. כולם אחר כך uh, היו מלחמות בשביל הדבורה שלו, שאף אחד לא יזיק לה uh, כמה זה, זה משהו מיוחד לעולם. זה... ואנחנו יד... יודעים, זה גם בקוראן, <coughs> כתוב על הדבורים ועל ה... uh, ה... הטוב שלה, על כל הדברים הטובים שלה לעולם, לכל העולם. אבל אחרי ששמענו בדיוק בכל הדברים הקטנים האלה, זה משהו, משהו אחר, זה משהו אחר. ואני חושבת שתוכנית כזו, אם תסתובב לעולם, זה יעזור מאוד. Then I w yeah, I went and brought uh, two beehives without knowing anything. And slowly, I remember one day, I, I called Yossi to... Yossi, I, I don't know. And he told me, so listen to the bees. They will tell you what, is, uh, what <laughs> you need to do. We make oils for uh, medical oils, and then we make bombs, and so we have the was. Post, uh, shava? Uh, yeah, wax. Pops, wax. So we have wax and we have the honey and we have propolis and we have... And so it's also a matter of why you growing bees and mainly the question is how. It's not like keeping a dog. <laughs> If you keep a dog Then you think about the food, where it comes from, and you walk the dog. This is what you do. But bees are not dogs. So if you have bees, you have to think about their food. If you think about their food, you have to think about the insecticides. If you think about the insecticides, you have to think about the trees. You have to think about the bushes. You have to think about the place. You have to think. So automatically, you start looking at different things. You, you start thinking about... What does that mean, agriculture of uh, bee or bees? What does it mean, agriculture of cows? 
Mm. Does the fisherman love his fish? Mm. We are not sure. Mm. Does the beekeeper love his bees? We are mm. not sure. I think bees uh, have this ability to connect you very quickly back to nature. To have your own awareness about what's going on in my neighborhood, mm. what's going on in the field next to me. Mm -hmm. How do we allow airplanes to throw chemicals around my house. What is this? Is this normal? What about my bees? My bees will die. You meet very quickly all things that are connected in nature for bees. So just to end, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. So just to end, um, this was a short expert of, of the film that we are editing at the moment. And we had amazing meetings with everyone in Israel. And um, we hope to share more of it in the future. Thank you for hosting us. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you for joining us, and you already gave us a teaser of uh, one of the projects that we will be showing soon, of uh, the East Jerusalem uh, Beekeepers Collective, Women Beekeepers Collective, that uh, Naama is one of its members, and uh, Tarek will be talking about it soon. Um, so thank you, the three of you, for doing and you're the film. I'm, we're looking forward to see the full version. Do us a Zoom watch party and we all, we all, we're, we're all going to, to see it. Um, we are going now to go over to Slovenia. And as you all know, Slovenia is not just a country in Europe, it's also the big capital of the world, if we can say so. And thanks to them, we have this B-Day that was uh, established. And I'm inviting uh, Mrs. Tanya Arie from Epiroots. Epi Hello, everyone. Hi, Tanya. Hi from Slovenia. Yes, it's not a shiny day, but still the weather is improving. Uh, a bit of sunshine is coming through. So it's a perfect day to celebrate the World Bee Day. And I'm happy and thankful uh, to be the part of this great community here, uh, listening uh, to all of you with your speeches, um, with your... Uh, I'm actually excited about the attitude, uh, what you have to the bees, and this is the same what correlates me to the bees and uh, develop up here in Actually, I was also um, at the very beginning of this initiative for World Bee Day. Uh, I'm trying to develop um, the rise, the awareness, and the importance of the bees through apiturism. This is a novel concept on the global level and it's fusion of travel and apiculture to introduce the magic of the bees, their lives, uh, also to other people that. that they don't know this uh, so far. Uh, so we got an idea after Apimundia 2003 that was held in Slovenia, um, Slovenian Beekeeping Organization, uh, they come to us. We were partners for their travels of Apimundia worldwide. Uh, came to me and said, um, we would like to do something more, not just visiting, not just seeing um, uh, a beekeeper, but show us, uh, show people how beekeepers are living. You know, um, 
In Slovenia, it might be something that is very common to see bee houses around Slovenia. We have more than 10,000 10, in all places. Uh, this is not common in other countries. Uh, our beekeepers, they build houses for their bees uh, and they paint the beehive front panels. Front panels. So they are like open galleries. Uh, I'm sure you already seen some pictures uh, from the landscape and our bee houses. So the other idea was uh, how what we can do more than just visiting uh, the beekeeper. So to enter the beehive, enter the bee house. So there is a natural um, epitherapy in uh, beehives in Slovenia. At that point, uh, I said, okay, uh, I'm going to start to develop the idea how to combine the travel and uh, the culture. And I was 100% sure that something of this already exists um, in other countries. Uh, but there were zero points. Actually, I know there are few people developing on their own, but uh, the way we did it in Slovenia, now it's, uh, this project is going on on the national level. Uh, we um, invited our beekeepers uh, to open their houses uh, to other beekeepers from other countries and also to other people that want to be uh, to see what apiculture is, what honey bees uh, can teach us. Um, so we actually established one certification system. All our beekeepers uh, that are um, accepting groups or individual um, uh, travelers, they have a certificate of excellence. So it's not only uh, important um, how you are dressed, and uh, it's more about what you show to people, how you speak about uh, the bees, uh, trying to teach them about the importance of the bees for humankind. So with uh, our um, family business, is travel company, obviously, uh, we already did tours around the globe. Uh, actually, we are um, each year uh, many times in Israel. Our primary business, uh, um, is pilgrim. So Israel, the Holy Land, is one of our top uh, tours uh, uh, for all Christians. Uh, the Holy Land is a must. And uh, at uh, Apimondia in Ukraine, there was um, Gil Ratia, at that time the president of Apimondia, who compared uh, this thing like like every uh, Christian pilgrim has to visit once, once in a lifetime the Holy Land. The same is for the beekeepers, they have to come to visit Slovenia for this reason, because in Slovenia, uh, they said for the beekeepers, uh, the bees are in their hearts, and uh, what they do is coming from their heart. This is why they start to build houses. This is why they start Paint the bee houses. Uh, and the love to the bees um, uh, actually is spread all around Slovenia, as I said, more than 10,000 beehives all around. Now, a lot of beekeepers are um, trying to do something more than just uh, honey production. So, this is the opportunity when it comes to the front uh, to open their houses. Uh, either as a museum, either as epitherapy center, uh, breeding centers, uh, different, um, uh, how to say, um, beekeepers have specialized in their own way. Uh, and this is what we would like to show to other people coming and visiting Slovenia. And our idea, we are organizing, of course, tours. Uh, one part is um, professional uh, tours for beekeepers uh, coming to visit Slovenia, and the other part uh, we call this inspired travel uh, for other people coming to, uh, to visit Slovenia, but not only for the must in Slovenia, but also for apiculture. And I have to say, for the last 10 years, we are developing, creating these tours, addressing culture, nature, spirit. Uh, the best, I think, the best. Part of the tour is a visit to our beekeepers. Uh, 
uh, this is like uh, the five star experience uh, because we always do like small um, uh, questionnaire what people like from the tour and the best ratings were uh, for the beekeeping visits either urban urban beekeeping centers or their breeding centers epitherapy centers herbal beekeeping farm it doesn't matter actually when people uh, beekeepers do this with with their heart uh, it's the best visit ever and uh, so the idea of our company or my uh, idea is to spread this course worldwide to show to, to, to implement our model that we established in Kenya. it might be established also in other countries just it has to be adapted to the culture and to the landscape uh, environment of course um, we also organize uh, beekeeping tours to other destinations around the world and i must say i'm very very sad because we were planning uh, to organize a professional beekeeping tour to israel this september uh, i was uh, in connection with mr yossi so we uh, he played uh, he helped us uh, plan the visit uh, as i don't know personally so many beekeepers and places uh, to organize by myself so it will be one of the starting uh, cooperation also uh, with Israel on the beekeeping uh, side thing. The other thing uh, I would also uh, like to point out is uh, that uh, I'm also um, in charge of um, Apimondia working group for apitourism. So the idea I was talking just previously is to help other countries around the world uh, to implement uh, apitourism um, uh, in their destination uh, because I think apitourism is a very um, big add value to beekeepers. I don't know how it is in other countries, uh, but I think that uh, living from uh, selling honey, it's not um, it's not enough. Uh, I can see in Slovenia. It's a matter of uh, weather uh, we had for three years bad weather here, bad season, so we cannot just rely on the honey. And uh, apitourism can be a great uh, add value, not only for the money, uh, for the beekeeper, for their uh, economy um, success, but uh, also the importance uh, to show, to raise the wealth of the bees in the humankind. Uh, this is in few words uh, in if anybody is interesting to hear more i hope i outline the idea what apiturism is and the concept uh, i will be gladly to share with you um, we have a website uh, apiroots.com you can read more about our tours um, about uh, our mission uh, maybe also this point uh, we are now trying uh, to prepare also the programs for um, companies like uh, business uh, with uh, with some uh, let's say incentive programs uh, with the bees and uh, seeing the bees uh, how the bees are functioning uh, following uh, their manners uh, their attitude it can be a great um, example of how we should do it in our life, to we'll implement in our life. So the idea is to enrich our life. This would be from my side. Thank you. Um, wow, thank you, Tanya. Um, personally, this is fascinating for us here in Jerusalem, as we are uh, hoping to start our own tour initiatives uh, around beekeepers. And we would be happy to learn from you. And I'm sure there are many others around that with us here that might learn. Uh, we are now in, in general in, in times that tourism as a concept is under a big question mark. And I think we need also to be very brave to ask ourselves questions about the, this idea as a what does it serve and how can it serve us maybe better. As we said before, if we don't want to go back to the, what used to be normal, we need to rethink everything. And also, I think this is an opportunity for us to think about tourism. 
maybe the word pilgrimage carries <laughs> yeah, something true. maybe deeper for with a higher meaning for what we're trying. But uh, yeah, definitely we sure. are on the way. And thanks for your all this uh, introduction to your world. Um, our next. Thank you for inviting. In just a second, I will yes. be happy um, if uh, anybody from all around the globe uh, would like to interact with us, to share with us uh, dear products, uh, dear ideas. Uh, we can, I, I'm, I believe we can establish one great community on the worldwide level. So thank you. Definitely. And this is exactly what we're doing here, establishing a worldwide mm -hmm. community. Uh, yeah, learning from the bees, right? Um, so our next uh, partner, uh, you know, I, I'm sitting now in West Jerusalem. Uh, we're sitting in one city, but we're actually in two cities. So Starek is living in East Jerusalem and is a great friend. And we've been working mm -hmm. together for a long time now. And Tarek, you are with us? Yes, I am. Hey, Tarek. Hello, hello, Matan. Hello, everyone. Hello, Yossi. Hello, I, I know some of them. And uh, it's really interesting to be here today, guys, like uh, almost the whole day, which is really yeah, a little bit weird, you know, like to have a conference uh, on Zoom. Uh, today, I will be talking about the experience of uh, becoming a bee lover, to tell you the truth. Um, I never thought that I would be a bee lover. I'm an architect and urban planner. And I never thought that I would be not afraid of bees first. But uh, I think uh, many thanks to Yossi Ob and Matan that they helped me to, to fall in love with bees, really. Um, okay, I, I, will, I will show you... Uh, presentation how the whole thing started and how uh, okay can you see the uh, the presentation guys yes we can see it okay okay so it's it's really the beehives and issues and this is the story of beehives and how we initiated uh, a center a sustainability center in this idea that came from the beehives and um, the whole thing started with in, in, in the public library of East Jerusalem. It's the center public library in the middle of East Jerusalem, which, which is 450 meters uh, away from the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, in, in, this, in this library, we started the project of uh, building a community uh, garden. So this project, I was involved, and we built a community garden, and it was really interesting. And at the same time, I, I, I was invited to, to see Muslala, where his Matan is located, and they are doing a beautiful work at Binyan Klal, which, which is located in West Jerusalem. So this library, it's in East Jerusalem. The Matan and Muslala's uh, area, it's in West Jerusalem. And... Uh, I was really inspired and surprised and what's, what's going on there. And all the time it, it was in my mind that because of that, so here's Yossi Od and Matan and we are really crazy people sometimes, I think. Like, uh, uh, this is a, a, with the visit that we made to Muslala, to West Jerusalem with the manager of the library, Amar Layubi. I hope he's here. I sent him the link to join. But he's the host of the whole idea of creating something in East Jerusalem uh, in, his, in, in the library. So we started this idea. Okay, let's make a course. Uh, Yossi, he's, uh, uh, he's the expert. Uh, let's make a course and we focus on women. And why we focus on women in East Jerusalem? In the beginning, I was not really convinced to just focus on women in East Jerusalem. Uh, but uh, at a certain point right now, I believe that you'll see he was right. Women, they are the key of change. And women, the, the unemployment rate and the poverty rate in East Jerusalem, we're talking about over 70%. Uh, 
And as an urban planner, I took this project as more like an environmental and economic project. Uh, and when we announced for the course, we, uh, we received 100, almost 100 applications in two weeks. 100 applications of women to become a beekeepers because they want to get some kind of uh, attention. They need to, to, to go out of their houses, not just because most of them, they're not working. And uh, uh, it's an opportunity because in the announcement it was saying that we need to, to have uh, an urban beehive so that they can become a beekeepers in urban cities in, this, in, in East Jerusalem. So they can use the roofs, uh, balconies, or uh, small land if they, they do have. Uh, so it was really interesting to, to receive almost 100 applications. And uh, many, many partners, the, 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 the join us in this project is the municipality of Jerusalem, uh, uh, Mati and uh, Er Amim, uh, so it's really, it was really nice. And uh, the World Bees Project. Uh, uh, so uh, the, we started the course. We only had to, to start with uh, 15 women because, uh, you know, like uh, it depends on the fun and because we, we each woman will take, uh, uh, it will receive a box, it will be hive. And uh, so we just started 15 women. We covered all over East Jerusalem. So from the north to the south. Here, where Yossi was uh, hosting us in his house with all the group, the women. And it was really interesting to see how we can handle uh, in practical way the, 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 the beehives. And I was with him, of course. I was like not really a participant, but I became a participant and I became a bee lover. Uh, just a few pictures. And the whole course actually it was hosted in the library. In the public library, and and the, the role of the library all over the world was changed. And I think uh, for the last two years we have been trying to change the role of the library in East Jerusalem as well, with a community garden, then uh, having more uh, beehives course and roof gardening that I will show you right now. Uh, here is uh, each each participant. She got the certificates that she's becoming a woman beekeeper, um, and we have actually uh, we have participants uh, ages between the, the average ages actually the range it was between 22 to 65 years old, which is was really interesting to see the mix between the participants. Here, this picture it's really. Uh, good memory that we, we have been distributing the beehives in East Jerusalem neighborhoods um, at night. Me, Yossi, Matan, and uh, this uh, guy, Muhammad, he's a uh, son of one of the participants. Here we distribute, we, we, we have boxes uh, actually uh, very close to the separation wall, where is uh, separate West Bank to, uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, we built community through this course and the beehives actually we built community the community of the women they started to be very strong they talk to each other uh, they ask questions the they're really like I'm, I'm i'm in this whatsapp group and actually uh yossi and they see like they they become a family a family of a, a woman uh, uh, a keeper in jerusalem there is uh, uh, Nama, the, the lady that uh, you saw in the, in the previous movie from our friend in Spain. Uh, she became you know, the supervisor of the woman, uh, helping them, going to, to, to work with them. Uh, just a few pictures. This, this is one of the beautiful in, uh, uh, area that it's in the, bill, it's in the middle of East Jerusalem, it's very close to the center. You can see actually the, the old city from here in Abu Tor. And this roof, it was never used. And when, when the woman, she received the box of the beehives, and then she started to use the roofs and the, she started to, to, to have more and more green. And uh, this is her husband. So, and personally, I always believe that using the roofs in, 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 in such 
informal areas, very dense areas of East Jerusalem neighborhoods, it's what, it might be one of the solutions to fill the gap of the lack of public open spaces, whereas uh, it's, a cause, it's, it's, it's a cause actually of missing planning and issues in East Jerusalem. Uh, so this is really the community that we're building and we're working with them. Uh, right now, some of them, they have uh, four colonies. Uh, some of them, we, they just started with one. And some of them, they have three and two. So this is the Jerusalem Bihavis map of East Jerusalem. So we have all over East Jerusalem. And here is the, 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 the idea that we started and we right now, actually, we we have been working on it. It's, we initiated the Sincilla uh, Center called Sincilla. Uh, it's in the library. Uh, we use the terraces of the library and the room to be to have a, 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 bee, a beehives, an urban beehive center. Uh, this is the location of the of the the library. This is the old city. Here is like more, uh, this is East Jerusalem, this is West Jerusalem, and this is road number one. And almost Binyan Klal, it's uh, where is Musla located, it's in this area. So it's, it's very close actually between East and West. So it's, uh, this is the, div the, the road that somehow divide the city between East and West. But the whole story started that because of, there is lack of public open spaces, there is no community and decrease of green elements. And personally, I believe that placemaking would, would I, I'm, I'm more like a professional to, to work on and, uh, and roofs, how to reuse roof, how to, to, to make urban farming in, in such a, a build density in East Jerusalem. So we came up with this uh, idea that uh, it was an idea in the beginning and then we initiated it. It's, we need a place where uh, it can be an inspiring place for community to come and see. Uh, we need really a, a Muslala version from West Jerusalem to be in East Jerusalem, but with the, with the added value, with the cultural and all the values of Palestinian in East Jerusalem. Uh, so this is the, 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 the whole idea of Sinsila. This is the library, whereas the two terraces was never used. And there is a room between them that was never used as well. So our partners right now, we're talking about really around like five to six partners working on this idea. Muslala, Ibkri, uh, community gardens and in, in, in the municipality, the Jerusalem model uh, through the Liftag Foundation, which is located in Santiago, uh, the municipality of Jerusalem. So it's really, it's, it's a lot of work. That's what we're trying to do. It's more like uh, more connecting partners in order to make sustainable projects. Uh, we, we, the same group, we opened a roof gardening course. Uh, and now the, the planted gardens and, and plants that uh, attract uh, bees, actually. Uh, those pictures, it's just... Uh, Two week, a week ago, actually, yeah. Uh, most of the participants they started to plant at their houses after they, 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 they got this course. So it's all about planting. This is what I heard a lot today, actually, from the participants. Uh, so then we started to have an urban beehive center to, to, to design an urban uh, beehive center to be for educational purpose and uh, inspiration as well. So here is the, the idea of a man sitting in the middle and speakers that will sh hear the noise, the, the sound of the bees. Uh, this is exactly in the middle of March, it was settled. And after the corona, it's a, like, it's a little bit now on hold. Uh, but uh, here, where is, uh, Yossi was giving uh, uh, in the center uh, uh, how to make a new colony from that col the, the beehives colony in the center. Uh, yeah, we did a lot of gathering and events and building community. Uh, what elements that we need to combine in, in, in such project like that. In the coronavirus, we in, in East Jerusalem, we're talking really about before the coronavirus it was around 70%. Uh, a buffer to rate in East Jerusalem. So we, we, we had the opportunity to, to, to give uh, 
uh, the food rescue, like rescuers from West Jerusalem for East Jerusalem, is like the, the, the huge uh, market, the vegetables market in West Jerusalem that usually we have leftovers or uh, bad quality or it's not really a bad actually. And we connected uh, uh, this project to East Jerusalem neighborhoods and volunteers to distribute more and more vegetables uh, in East Jerusalem neighborhood. And we distributed as well uh, food coupons and uh, some masks. So this is just uh, two weeks ago. And uh, we're still working on, on with Yossi and he's leading the whole woman beehives in East Jerusalem with a Zoom meeting, showing them where we can, how we, how to, to handle, uh, it was a springtime, uh, their uh, colonies. This is really our, our uh, idea. It's, we, we, we created, we need to create an area for education, inspiration and employment. And beehives, it's one of the main pillar. Beehives, it's more education and inspiration and employment because women, they need to have a woman cooperative honey in the future for selling and maybe producing more and more honey and uh, teaching as well and roof gardening. So it's really like, what's really uh, our vision of such a place like that to become a place, a, sp a space to become a place. So this is our our detailed design of the whole two terraces. Right now we are in the middle of trying to fundraise for doing this. We're talking about two outer spaces, two terraces, one room, uh, a community cafe for honey and tea will be hopefully will be established for our woman group. Uh, uh, this is more the urban, uh, uh, the educational peace center to host uh, groups, small groups of to teaching them about uh, bees. Unfortunately, in school systems of East Jerusalem, there is no beehives courses. Kids, they never hear about or, or take any courses. And I think this is an opportunity and this is what's, what we need to do and to, to focus right now. We will try to handle the issue of renewable energy as well here in, in the outer space and home biogas so it's, so it's more like really uh, the beehives it's one of the main pillar in, in the center of sincilla uh, by the way sincilla in arabic it means the uh, the way to build stones uh, in agricultural terraces uh, so here we're talking about the ideas of more renewable energy uh, Tarek. yes i'm done um you know while you were talking and before we were talking about tourism and we were talking about yeah. the change in the world. And I think for as a, a person that's been involved in this project, I think first of all, what you are doing is absolutely amazing. And I want to thank you in front of all the bee lovers here because you opened a new space in East Jerusalem. And this is not something small, you know, like many of us, I would say privileged to live or, or be present in places that are more natural or, but actually East Jerusalem is one of the harshest places right now that I know, uh, one of the poorest places. And definitely what you said, green at all, not a place that is friendly for bees. And no. through, through, your, through your uh, devoted work and through the entire project that we've been working, each one of the beekeepers, each one of beehives, each one that is turning into a green roof is giving so much inspiration and That's hope. Uh, I want to thank you for all of this work that you've been doing. And yeah, yeah. And this, there is an, a very uh, a big opportunity and I was trying to imagine that maybe one day all of us will meet on the big center in East Jerusalem after we did a long pilgrimage, each one walked from his home and it was a big bee pilgrim. Um, inshallah, inshallah, I hope so. Inshallah. Many, many thanks for your words. So if Thank anyone wants to be in contact with Tarek, just maybe leave your uh, email in the chat so people can be in touch with you if they're interested. And, and after thanking you, I want to introduce somebody that was thanked so many times this day. <laughs> Uh, Yossi, Yossi Ud, that is uh, somewhere on the other side of 
the terrace of this roof. Uh, Yossi, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. So I think Yossi is one of the persons that I'm not sure that I, f I need to introduce. Because uh, I have a feeling that almost everyone here knows him and met him somehow in some, some point of his big career. I would just say that uh, for me, Yossi is uh, the ambassador of bees. So, um, please, Yossi, mm -hmm. the stage is yours, the mic is yours. Yeah. Um, so, um, I'm so impressed and I have a little wet on my eyes for all we heard and all these people that came together here. Um, so, I will start ha somehow, anyway. Um, when I'm sitting here on the roof, rooftop, and look around Jerusalem, uh, so hard city and so beautiful city, so good and hard things are going from here outside and coming from outside here, all the religious and all the nationalities and all the politics and all the difference around the world are here in Jerusalem, come to here and go from here outside. And stay here, of course, <laughs> also. So um, when we are here, collaborate, when you're together, it's real excite me. I will say just a few things about what we heard here about uh, Michael and uh, from uh, Albert and other uh, talks uh, on the uh, on the session before. We talk about the Varroa. Albert, you told us that uh, the Varroa mite is one of the big enemy of the beehive around the world, except Australia and you other just a few other places around the world. And uh, your colony live with them together, also our colonies here in Jerusalem. So the bees learn to live with their enemy together, with peaceful. And when you are learning to live with your enemy, with peaceful, you understand that you don't have enemies. So. I think this is the main uh, uh, issue, the main things that we are trying uh, to make here in Jerusalem and all over Israel, um, to, to teach, to learn the people to live together with the bees. And everybody of us, me, when I was, since I was a child uh, until I was an adult, they don't like insects and spread from stinging insects. It's a real normal. And we are giving the people the opportunity to make the transformation from animals that you are afraid from it, from the stinging, to the situation, the transformation that you make, the situation that you love him. I think that is the best the tool, best thing to um, to feel people to, to, to teach people to cross the um, to learn to know other people to learn uh, to live with a stranger to live to cross all the difference between people that make us far away from them to come close. And I will show you a little film, I think. Oh, the internet falls down, so I will try to show you it, maybe. Uh, when I see a children, a child, and the first moment he is afraid, afraid to, from bees, and after 10, 15 minutes, he is holding his hand to the bees and said, oh, please sit in my, on my hand. For me, it's still everything. This transformation that he make, he can take it to the tool, to his life, to his neighbor, 
to break stigma, to break uh, 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 any uh, uh, far away from other people, from strangers. So maybe we'll see some uh, one or two uh, uh, painting of children that I will go back to the film and show you two or three minutes. So while Yossi is looking for the film, I'll just say for those of you, the picture, the, the paintings that you see are, were done by children that were invited by us and by the Slovenian ambassador uh, to paint their ideas about bees, about the world. And I think sometimes when you look at bees paintings, you can sense, you know, you can look at their approach to the world. And I hope, and I wish that we would be able, us as adults, maybe to, to learn also from the kids, from their perspective. So maybe I can share now. No, I need your permission to share uh, Shahar. Sorry to interrupt. Will there be time for questions? Um, if we will see that the video doesn't work, we will have time for questions. Okay. And anyway, you can send us questions in the chat and we'll try to also later on find a way to react to them. Okay, thank you. Mama? Oh my God, I'm not Gabby. Okay. So, um, we have a lot of uh, to share about it, but we are really short in time. Our timekeeper tell me. So for me, the transformations that people make, make, make from the moment that you're afraid to the moment that they are living together in the town, in the city, in the balcony, in the roof, in the schools, in the main uh, uh, library of the municipality, this is the added value, uh, the biggest added value that I can get how people can cross the line from enemy to friend. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yossi. And I guess uh, so many other people that would like to thank you right now, but I'm the only one that has the mic. Uh, but I'm going, uh, before we're going to move to our next speaker, we're going to mention our, last, our next uh, uh, Zoom meeting that is with ambassadors, ambassadors, real ambassadors uh, from all over the world um, that are going to tell us a bit about the B situation, their B, uh, B activity in their countries. And it's going to be ambassadors from all continents and it's going to be inspiring and interesting also to see how politicians or uh, um, diplomats understand the importance of bees as messengers of peace and harmony in our planet. Um, our next, our next, our next uh, speaker. Um, right. Uh, our next speaker, uh, uh, she's already with us, Jacqueline Freeman from Spirit B, and she's come from Washington. 
Jacqueline, you are with us? Yes, she's here. Let's see if we can hear you. In the meantime, until you connect to the speaker. Hi, Jacqueline. Hello, hello. Good morning. Good morning. For us, it's good evening. And <laughs> I guess there are people over there that's for them. It's uh, some different day already. Surely uh, this is all around the world. <laughs> And a few words about Jacqueline. So Jacqueline encourages people to work with bees, with love, respect, and good-heartedness. She wrote the book, Song of Increase, listening to the wisdom of honeybees for kinder beekeeping and a better world. The book is in English, Dutch, French, and Spanish, and on Audible. She is also the co-founder of, uh, of the charity Preservation Beekeeping. Jacqueline has been in relationship with bees for nearly 20 years. She relies upon their wise intelligence as her guidance. So we rely upon your wise intelligence and the bees intelligence for, as our last speaker for this Zoom meeting. Jacqueline, please. Yes, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I want to talk about trusting bees. I think so many times we presume that as humans, we know what's best. And there's been so many times in my life when I've done something with bees where I've stopped myself and tuned into where the bees are and then made a different decision out of it. So I want to tell, tell a few stories about different times that has been useful to me. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about because it's so recent, about two years ago, here on the farm, I live in Southwest Washington on the Pacific Northwest part of the United States. And we have a farm and we're sort of on the edge of national forests. And two years ago, uh, we had a forest fire. And the forest fire blazed for over a month. And this whole area where we live, it came within 10 miles of our farm. Now 10 miles as a forest fire goes is not very distant. And we lived in very thick smoke for a full month. And then even after the forest fire was put out, which took almost a month, we had quite a bit of thick smoke for another two weeks after that. So smoke that was so dense, they said it was like uh, smoking two packages of cigarettes a day just to go outside. And then for two weeks after that month, it was still very smoky outdoors. Um, what happened during that was I had about, I think I had around eight hives that live on my farm at that point in all different kinds of hive, of hive bodies. And the bees actually made it through that time just fine, nothing happened. However, about a month or two afterwards, it was devastating. What happened was when the forest fire was so smoky around here, my queens stopped laying. There was very little activity of the bees going outside of the hive itself. They stopped laying. Now, the bees that hatched in September, this was September going into October, the bees that hatched in September were the last hatch that happened. And when we got up to November, I should have been having a winter hatch. These were going to be the bees that survived through the winter carrying everybody through. And that hatch didn't happen. So by December, um, by December, I was seeing a, a big fall off in population. By January, I had lost all my hives but one. One hive that lived in a tree made it through. My second to the last hive um, that made it through also lived in a tree, didn't quite make it through the whole winter. But I came into spring, it was devastating. I, one, I came into spring with one hive left and everyone else died from it. And they didn't die from being burned up, they died from the thickness of the smoke in the air and it interrupting the, the, um, the, the laying pattern that the queen would have done. So this is where I want to talk about trust. I didn't repopulate when it came to spring. Now, certainly, it's easy for me to get a swarm. I have lots of friends around here. There were many people who offered to give me um, swarms from their bees in the springtime. And I kept checking in, and this is something I, I do all the time. I, I check in and I, I, I have to get a feeling 
that that's right. I have to see myself doing something before I take action on this. And so I didn't introduce any new bees that year at all. I just didn't feel like it was right. And I also had this question in my mind about, you know, what happens if I follow nature's cue? What happens if instead of me saying, oh, I'm supposed to have this many hives, I'll bring them all back. What happens if I just watch and see what nature does by itself? We at the same time had been having an inundation of yellow jackets. And for the two years prior to that, wow, they were hot and heavy. I had about one day in, in midsummer, we went up to the, where a lot of my different hives are in all different areas. And we found seven ground nests of yellow jackets um, within 200 feet of any of the hives. They, now yellow jackets have a role, you know, they, they eat what's dead or dying. So I figured, well, in the environment, there was a lot of dead and dying and that was what their job was. So I try not to interfere with that either, to let the natural flow of things go. Anyway, um, for two years, I will admit, I had really been struggling to protect my bees from the yellow jackets. And then this next year, after I was down to one simple hive and watching and going, oh, it pains me not to have more bees here, but I'm gonna watch and see what happens here. The yellow jackets didn't have anything to eat much, I guess. And the yellow jackets, the, the yellow jacket population just plummeted. And they were still here after the forest fire, but then they plummeted when they lost so much of the volume of what to eat. So what happened was I was trusting that the, at the right time, the bees would return. And so there was a whole entire year where that balance of yellow jacket to honeybees and native bees, um, that yellow jacket population was skewed, it was off, it was too high, and then boom, it just plummeted. And then this year, this year, I have bees coming back again, which is delightful, delightful. And um, I'm just so happy about that. The bees are coming in from different places and they're finding the freedom hive and they're finding the wall hive that's in my house and they're finding, they're, they're scouting out the skeps. I'm just in the peak of when the bees are all looking and I can see a great number of my hives that are out there are having intense interest or bees have already moved in. So I'm coming right back to this is the normal flow. So I am so happy that I did not violate that feeling that I had of let the bees do it the way that nature intends rather than me coming in and making a big old presumption about it and doing it. So um, I, I have a friend, Susan Nylans, who co-founded the uh, charity with me, Preservation Beekeeping, and she had a really interesting thing happen. We are in our lockdown um, and we have, you know, no, none of the public buildings are open. And one of the places that we have a tree hive is we've like a like a freedom hive. Um, we've uh, put one up in the library in the town that Susan lives in. And in years past, the librarians would always call when they swarmed and she'd go over and pick up the swarm. And um, it's different this year. No one's working at the library. So no one is watching and monitoring to see when they're going to swarm. So she was sitting at home and so she saw someone um, walk by who said, oh, I saw a swarm up at the library early, a few hours ago, earlier today. And she jumped in the car and dashed up there and found that indeed there had been a swarm and someone had come out and sprayed them and killed them. Um, the swarm that was just all in a puddle underneath a, a tree branch and heartbreaking, heartbreaking. And then the next day she was trying to figure out how am I going to know when there's a swarm there or not? And she was doing something and all of a sudden she said, I just had the idea that the bees were calling me. And she jumped in her car and drove a quarter mile over to where the library was and said, no, there's nothing going on here. It's just normal bee activity. And she was just standing and watching them. And then within three minutes, the swarm started. So they actually contacted her. Now, that kind of trust comes too because a thought comes into your head and then you take action on, on this is a message and you go and see how, how hard is it to go and check that out. 
rather than saying, oh yeah, the bees. So I think this is one of the ways that you develop that, that ongoing relationship with them. You hear stuff, you feel stuff, you, you imagine something in your mind, and then you connect with the bees to find, is this something that's true? Is this something I should do? Is this something I should be aware of? And that's the process that I go through with that all the time. Um, oh, oh, I'm, I'm, I forgot. I'm supposed to be sharing pictures. Can I share screen with you? And I can show you some pictures. Please do, yes. <laughs> okay. There. And, whoops. <laughs> Turn my volume down here. Anyway, um, there's when I pay attention to bees, I notice all of the different feelings in, that I have inside that lead me to either trust or not trust um, myself. And I'm actually going to jump ahead. I forgot to play this, so excuse me. Here we go. I'm going to tell you about a swarm that I went to catch um, a few years ago. And this is actually video I have of this exact same uh, swarm that I was going to catch. I went outside and saw that there were bees were swarming in my bee yard. Now, Many of you, I'm sure, have caught a swarm and how simple it is to do that. They, you wait till they gather together somewhere and put them in a box and move them over to a hive. I've done that hundreds of times. And these bees, now I have this on slow motion, but I want to tell you something really curious about these bees. These bees did not settle. I was walking among this swarm, and this is in my north yard, and these bees, for a good 45 minutes to an hour, just did this. It was so unusual because generally they move to an area and then they coalesce into the, the swarm and then, and then that's it. Um, and these bees were everywhere. They were, they'd landed on my hair. They were walking up and down my arms. Um, they finally, after close to an hour, 45 minutes to an hour, they began to settle and they settled about 15 feet up a tree. And I went and got a ladder and I climbed up and I sat next to them. And I, they were an enormously large swarm. They were, um, when I was sitting up in the tree next to them, they were as wide as my shoulders. And I was facing them and we were just like of equal size up there. And I was watching them and the sun came through and it just through the bees, it was just beautiful. I spent three hours up in the top of that tree um, with these bees, just watching them. And I could have picked them up as a swarm at any moment. I was fully prepared. Everything was ready to go. But I was just watching them and I was, I was just in that ecstasy of being next to a swarm. And then all of a sudden, after about three hours, the bees just lifted up it off. <laughs> and I have to tell you, the first thing that I did, the very first thing that I did was I berated myself about, you silly girl, you sat up here in the tree for three hours next to this swarm and you never once thought to put them in the box. And then I got past that thought. I realized that what I do when I collect a swarm is I always wait for a signal and there's some moment when I get an agreement from the bees. And that usually takes, uh, takes the form of me seeing the bees being moved into the box, seeing me moving them into the hive. Um, there's some next step that I see in my mind's eye. And I realized I never got that signal from them. And that's kind of unusual. And I realized by when I didn't get the signal from them that of course I don't take action. So without agreement from the bees, there is no action. And I believe that's a rightness of the way that it, it should be. And then off they took off to the forest up in the North Woods and deep in the woods, there they go. And that's what they wanted. And I felt really Jacqueline, happy with that I was able to do that. Jacqueline, yes. Um, we are about to finish. Our yep, time is over. Um, okay. 
So, first of all, I want really much, I know that you're in the middle, but because we have our next session uh, with few ambassadors and few people okay. that are, uh, I want to invite you, all of you, everyone to look at the chat and you'll see there the next link, copy it. And we're going soon to meet a few more friends of the, of the bees from the, from the entire world. And this is a great opportunity for, if you haven't noticed, to see that we have also been doing a live uh, footage from our beehive and to see the sunset. The, the propolis beehive is in this, now in the sun, sunset. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you for all the experts that joined us to this great session. Uh, I think I will take your words and say that fate and in hip, somebody, sorry, somebody there, unmute yourself. Yuval, please unmute yourself. Thank you. So I, I will just take your last word and say that emun and emuna in Hebrew, uh, uh, faith and trust are almost the same words. And this is maybe what we, are, we need. And this will lead us to the next session. Thank you.